All right, so filming class ranking videos done. That was a lot of those, many, many hours. Uh, editing done. Build video filmed. Build video in editing. All right. I think my channel sit for the next five months or so. Yeah, we. I mean, we got a lot of content, uh, so I think we are well and truly ahead of the game. Oh, what's this? A little video has popped up on my YouTube recommended page. There's a new playtest. Great. Maybe I can get a quick little review video out, you know, chase some of that interest. New weapons. Weapon feats. A new weapon mastery system. Two martial classes. All three mage classes. A dozen new customs. So this is coming out a little bit later than I would have liked, but. I hereby present Archetype Builds Reviews Playtest 1 D&D 5. So first up, the new weapons and weapon mastery system. The stated goal of this playtest is to give marshals more options and dynamic and strategic choices, uh, specifically in a combat setting. Spellcasters get, you know, all these spell slots and they get to choose which of their spells they're going to cast with them and they get options like upcasting, um, you know, using spell scrolls. There's a lot more turn-to-turn -turn decision making as a spellcaster, so we want to inject a little bit of that into the marshal. I think from that perspective, looking at the weapon mastery features, um, some of them are pretty good, some of them aren't very good. But only two of them add new options during combat. And the new option is, do I do the thing this lets me do or not? Uh, so I think from the perspective of adding dynamic and strategic decision making, um, this fails pretty miserably. Um, I am not going to spend too much time on reviewing like, each of the different weapon archetypes. I will say there should probably be more. Um, they released eight, I believe, with this uh, with this place. I think nine, um, and I just feel like if you were going to have this kind of whole subsystem be all about increasing player choice, remember different classes are looking for different types of weapons. They're they're leaning towards maybe these things like heavy weapons, or they're leaning towards ranged weapons, or they're leaning towards the kind of like light weapons for two weapon fighting. So you're, you're taking your weapon pool, you're dividing that by one-third. And then these, uh, these martial, these, these weapon mastery things only apply one per weapon, and they tend to be common amongst those groups. So in general, you're choosing between three of these, and two of them will be not good. <laughs> so... I don't think this provides a lot of choice either from like a character building perspective. I don't think you're going to change drastically what weapon you're using. Uh, and I also don't think turn to turn you are going to be paying much attention at all to what is the weapon mastery that you have active um, at the moment. So uh, don't think this is a, a win, but I like the idea and it does make different weapons feel significantly different. Um, you are paying attention to what weapon mastery is associated with that weapon. That is an important um, kind of keyword, the same as you know the finesse property would be, right? It's, it's significant. Um, right here on the screen, I'm gonna put my uh, my rankings for or my ratings for each of these uh, weapon masteries. You can see some of them are good, and some of them are not good, and some of them are right in between. Um, so if they were going for an even spread of bad options to good options, then they got it. <laughs> I think they nailed it. Um, but if they were going for a bunch of equally valid options, I think maybe they need to take another look. One I really want to call out is like the graze ability it lets you deal damage when you miss. And like the question I have to ask is like, how does this change anything? Like if you have the graze mastery and that's the one that you've selected, like, are you trying to miss more? Are you prioritizing other things and lowering your chance to hit so that you can just keep getting this graze damage? Are you trying to do like a bunch of different attacks specifically so that most of them will miss and you rack up that graze damage as opposed to hitting and dealing the same amount of damage but more? 
I, I just don't like what does this do from from the player's perspective what does this do and i feel like the answer is it makes failing a little bit less bad so if you are a really unlucky dice roller you take grays which is of course not not a real thing so not impressed there it does seem like the way this will work is for barbarians um, you generally already have advantage on your attacks so what you really are looking for here is cleave which is going to let you make an additional attack to an enemy within five feet which is very very good um, if you're you're recklessly attacking with that you've got advantage you can't add your ability modifier but you're still using probably a great axe which has cleave so you're dealing a, a d12 of damage to someone else so that's almost certainly what barbarians were going to do they were going to take the you know, the great axe and attack as many times as they could, which is what they were already doing. Um, I do like rogues here have a fun little combo. You can have one light weapon with the vex property, um, like a rapier or a hand axe, and make that attack. And if you hit, you give yourself advantage on the, the next attack. Whereas if, um, where if you have a weapon with the nick ability, allowing that uh, light you know, kind of two weapon fighting to be part of the same action. Um, you now have advantage giving yourself sneak attack on that second thing if it hits. So I think rogues with two weapon fighting could be quite fun, especially against lower armor class enemies, because you, you really don't want either of those hits to miss. Um, that would be a big bummer, because you, you wouldn't get the advantage, you wouldn't get the sneak attack if either of them miss. I think that is an interesting new playstyle, maybe that is popping up for for rogues. Um, and then fighters who get all of these extra attacks, they're probably looking for the topple feature, which lets you knock someone uh, prone if you hit them with your weapon. Um, they have, they make a saving throw, but you know they'll miss sometimes. Uh, they'll they'll fail their saving throw, um, and then you get advantage on all your subsequent hits. Um, the best topple weapons seem to be the maul for like two handed damage. This is the the two d six weapon now um, and then uh, if you're doing one hand actually trident looks like the best because it also can be thrown if need be which is great trident yeah love it it's weird also that there are very few ranged options here it seems like slow and vex are the only options available for ranged weapons um, and i don't think slow is particularly good this reduces someone's movement speed by 10 um, I guess for a ranged caster, if you're trying to prevent someone from getting to you, slowing them is, is helpful. But um, yeah, I think generally you take Hex with, or sorry, you take Vex with whatever uh, ranged weapon that you grab, and you're giving yourself advantage uh, every once in a while. Probably uh, really good with element accuracy if they put that back in the game. All right, so on to actual class changes um let's start with the barbarian they seem to have made a big deal about um rage is now prolonged by the player you use a bonus action to extend your rage rather than requiring you to be hit by someone you can also if you make an attack uh, it continues your rage as well so it's very proactive instead of reactive um, i don't think this is a big change um, barbarians generally didn't have anything to do with their bonus action but usually you're also making attacks so Generally speaking, you're going to prolong your range, your rage through attacks, the same way that you always did. I think the big call out here is that rage now lasts 10 minutes instead of one minute, which is, I think that's kind of intense. But um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to guess uh, mechanically this is a buff and barbarians you know, need a buff. So that's good. Um, raging for 10 minutes. And I guess uh, what this really is, is like if you're not sure if the combat has ended or not, or if there's like a second phase or a second wave or something like that, you can use your bonus action to keep yourself in that rage, like waiting for more enemies to arrive. Um, situational, but like I said, they needed the help. So you get weapon mastery, which I've talked about. And then there is a new feature called primal knowledge, which I'm fascinated by. Primal Knowledge is going to allow you to rage um, kind of like for outside of combat stuff. It changes certain skills, namely uh, acrobatics, intimidation, perception, stealth, and survival to be strength-based abilities while you are raging. I'll let that sink in for a second. So I have long complained that intimidation is like, it should be 
more universal. Like it, it, I hate that like charisma um, is the is the basis for intimidation because it's really about like how menacing you are. So I I kind of love the the effect of like barbarians can definitively say like now my intimidation is based on strength while I am raging, um, and I can I can intimidate as well as you know some of my charisma based counterparts and, and other stuff like that. I think that's cool. The rest I'm not sold on. Like how are you using strength? to perceive or to stealth or like i just maybe i need a little bit of help to understand how this fits into the class fantasy mechanically i understand that this is really good barbarians needed some help in being able to do stuff outside of combat this is help um and it specifically is like this little like utility boost that makes it so that you're you don't feel bad about maxing your strength which you wanted to do as a barbarian i just i just don't see like in the world of the game how this makes sense or is helpful a couple other mentions the brutal critical ability now adds your barbarian level instead of an extra weapon die this is almost certainly doubling how powerful this ability is um, it's incredible to see. It's going to feel amazing when you get it. Um, and that buff is, is pretty awesome. And I, I like the way that it scales as well, right? Um, as you continue to take barbarian levels, those criticals will keep getting more and more devastating. Onto the, the subclass, the Berserker. The Berserker obviously needed a rework badly. Ever since its inception, the Berserker has been like the most like devil's bargain class where you get um, you get your bonus action attack and Barbarians loved getting that that third attack. It's great, but then when your rage ends, it gives you a level of exhaustion, which was a devastating drawback, um, and something that I was very very harsh on in my uh, subclass ranking of that, which uh, will come out I guess in like two months or something like that. What they do now is uh, there's no exhaustion, there's no bonus action attack. Basically, when you're in your frenzy, um, once per turn, you do extra damage on one of your hits. I think it says the first hit of your turn. So, um, And the extra damage is equal to a number of d6s equal to your rage bonus. So for most of the game that's about 2 or 3 d6 added on to that hit, which is actually really comparable to like the rogue's sneak attack. It's very similar. And then there's no, there's no drawback or downside to that. So basically um, this subclass just lets you do extra damage. Mindless rage is buffed. You are now just cannot be charmed or feared while you are raging. That's great. Very helpful, fits the fantasy, I love it. And then uh, Intimidating Presence feels way cooler now. It's this big like, oof, like AOE fear um, instead of this kind of like single target, like, oh, let me pick on this guy. And then getting Retaliation earlier, um, uh, Retaliation is flipped with Intimidating Presence. Um, retaliation earlier, it just feels right. Overall, my feeling is that all of the classes are getting a little bit of a power boost, like a minor, like tick upwards, um, and these changes feel in line with that. It's kind of like getting 2% interest on a savings account and being like, wow, that's amazing, that's so much, and then remembering that like inflation is 2%, so it's just staying the same value. Um, that's kind of what it, I feel like here, and I've personally rated the Barbarians as the worst class in the game. I, I think, uh, spoilers for my uh, class ranking series, um, but I really do think that they, they needed a lot of help. Out of all the martial characters, they've got the fewest character building, the fewest um, like character action decision making. So um, I, I think they need, they need extra support. And I think this revision starts to make a dent in that, but it doesn't really go far enough. Um, and I think the biggest attempt at primal knowledge is feels really out of left field. So uh, something needs to change with the barbarian, and I, I don't think they fixed it. Fighter. Fighter has very few changes, but they are very impactful, so let's review. Weapon mastery, talked about this. Um, the fighter gets more weapon masteries. Uh, I imagine the fighter is now the person in the party who's like carrying like four different weapons, like just in case. Um, and you know, they, they never want to part with any of them because they've got their masteries for everything. Um, and maybe you'll get the chance to, to like, based on how a combat starts out, you draw the weapon that is most applicable. Um, and you can use its mastery. I, I really uh, I don't think that that is frequently going to occur, but um, you know, it's, it's kind of the fantasy that they're going for, right? 
second wind is changed. Uh, you can now do second wind multiple times per rest. Um, they have a little table showing you how many you can do. It's basically two to start, it goes up to three, and then to four, and it sticks at four for the rest of your progression. Um, that's good. Second wind was a pretty weak feature. They have buffed the amount that you're healing at all, but um, you know, being able to do it many times means you're overall going to be more resilient. Action surge is now restricted to certain actions. I think it's uh, attack, dodge, disengage. I might be missing one, but it, it's basically the the non-magical actions, right? Or the non-ability or magical actions. Um, they're, they're just trying to make this less impactful for multi-classing, I'm guessing. Indomitable is way better now. Um, when you re-roll that save, you add your fighter level, which is an enormous boost, and it, it's going to feel well and truly awesome when you use this. Fighters doing more with the weapon masteries as well. At level 7, they can swap the weapon mastery quality of a weapon that they're using for another. I guess the situations where you would want to do this is if you really want to use that particular weapon, but you don't like the mastery that's associated with it. Like maybe you don't like topple on your trident, but you really want to use a trident. Um, so you can swap it for something else like push or flex or something like that. Uh, and I guess the other reason you might do this is if you're restricted in which weapons you have access to. If you are like imprisoned, all of your equipment taken away, but you manage to find like a hand axe somewhere, you can you can swap the mastery that you want to there. Um, it still has to meet the prerequisites for the mastery, which again means you're going to be choosing from a very small pool. Um, this is not, you know, put whatever you want on there. You're going to be choosing like between like three or four of the nine weapon masteries um, to, to put on that weapon. Uh, it's nice to have, but I don't think it's, it's particularly strong. But then at 13th level, um, when you do this, you basically imbue it with two of these weapon mastery properties. You, can, you have to choose before you make the attack which one you're using for that attack. Otherwise, graze would actually be good um, because you could just choose graze as your second one on everything and if you miss. Uh, but no, they, they, they make sure to mention you have to do it before you make the attack roll. I want to like this, and I do think it gives them like that dynamic strategic decision making um, that Jeremy Crawford was talking about in his video, but uh, only at 13th level and only for fighters. And again, I just don't think that the selection is wide enough that you would actually care. I think this is the kind of thing where you grab topple, and then if they are already knocked prone, you pick up, I don't know, like cleave, or, uh, or maybe flex or graze or something like that, um, just to be like, I, you know, I can't knock him more prone than he already is. The last thing is Unconquerable is the new uh, high-level feature, and this is great. This basically says you're out of Indomitable. If you've used Indomitable, you can use your second wind count or like resource to re-roll your saving throw, but you also heal the second wind amount. So it combines the two, um, which is amazing. This is very, very good. This is a very good feature. Um, overall, the fighter does seem to have gotten, you know, some power boost, right? And I, I like the idea of making them the weapons guys, like the ones who are the most into the weapons that they're using and, and kind of playing around with that. I think weapon mastery needs another pass. I think weapon mastery needs to be reworked. And if they do that and do a good job, that rising tide will lift the fighter to where they need to be. So um, I think that's the issues with Weapon Mastery, not with Fighter. The Champion subclass is another one that really needed a rework, and I'm glad it got one. Uh, heroic Warrior is neat, allows you to give yourself a heroic advantage once uh, per combat, which is good for like fishing for those critical hits, which you're always looking for as a Champion Fighter. Everything else is the, the same. You get an extra fighting style at 6, which is nice. Um, uh, the Fighter's extra feat was moved from level 6 to level 5, so you are getting... Four is a feat, five is extra attack and a feat, which is crazy. And then if you're a champion, six is also a feat. So it's a very customizable class. Um, and then the level 14 feature is absolutely wild. So firstly, you have advantage on death saves, um, which is a pretty rare feature, I think. Um, and your critical bonus applies to these. So it counts as a 20 on a 19 as well. Um, which is super, super cool. And again, a 20 on a death save is, is two successes. With advantage, very high chance of, of coming back from dying. Very difficult to kill a champion fighter. And it, this is on its own, 
probably enough. Like this would be a relevant and interesting feature for a level 14 champion fighter. But no, you also get heroic rally, which says at the start of your turn, if you have less than half your hit points, you regenerate five plus your constitution modifier every turn. So you are just, this is especially good in those like prolonged combats or maybe combats where um, you guys are, are taking some steps, essentially not going all out, you know, mono a mono like maybe there's a, uh, a choke point or you're running away and just kind of like they're firing at you from behind champion fighter is is going to be just absolutely unkillable in those protracted combats um really really good so uh yeah this makes me think the champion fighter might be better at kind of like surviving a lot of damage than the barbarian is now um which is pretty incredible last thing for this video because the mage video that's coming out next will probably be longer um, i am dumping the feats and the rules glossary reactions here as well epic boons they seem much better um, i'm a little annoyed that they have a lot of different parts now all of them have like three different features tied up in the in the in the thing and it's like you know a lot to read but uh yeah they're epic so Mission accomplished on all of these. The weapon mastery feat, which is a level four, you get a weapon mastery, um, is pretty weak. Uh, I think it will be really, really rare that you need this. Um, you're either going to be a class that already gets a weapon mastery, um, or you are going to be a non-martial class that maybe lacks the proficiency in that weapon. Um, or like, I guess this is this is for like. Pact of the Blade Warlocks exclusively, who um, who have their packed weapon, which they are proficient with, um, but they don't haven't unlocked the mastery quality, so they take this feat. I, I think you might as well just like like just throw proficiency and mastery in the same feat. Just be like when you take this feat, choose a martial weapon, uh, you gain proficiency with it and have use of its weapon mastery feature. Something like that. Doesn't seem very good otherwise. Those are the feats. The rules glossary is way at the end of this 50 page document. So I wouldn't forgive most people for just not even getting that far. Um, they've seemingly reprinted a few things, uh, making it even harder to grasp like what's the new stuff. And a lot of the new stuff seems to be just kind of like wording clarification. So the stuff that isn't that best as I can tell, difficult terrain now comes with a long list of examples. Not sure how helpful this is, but it does feel like it's a direct response to like Triant Monk's complaint that um, difficult terrain was like too ambiguous and needed more clarity. So we have a long list of things that count as difficult terrain now. Uh, the death saving throw change seems good. I almost forgot that they had changed it in the last UA, and this is just kind of changing it back to something a little bit more normal. Um, so it's it's what you would expect. It's fine. Help now has two sub actions. Helping an ability check, um, you can do by just like, like being next to your ally, but helping an attack roll is different. Now the help roll explicitly states that you have to be within five feet of the enemy being attacked, um, and it works on the next attack against that enemy. So um, I guess there's two different help actions now, depending on what you're trying to help with. And then the big one in here I can see is they've thrown in this like social encounter system, explicitly spelling out the influence action which requires the DM to set the target's attitude, determine the appropriate uh, ability check, and determine the DC, and adjudicate the results. Um, this seems complicated, and there are so many points of ambiguity for the DM where it's like it's up to your DM to decide, that it, it does feel like you could just streamline this a little bit by saying like it's up to the DM how you, roll, <laughs> how you run these things. Uh, I don't know how much printing these rules actually accomplishes, but I guess if you need a launching point for how to run social interactions, uh, you can go through all these steps and all the steps are there. I actually like the uh, changes to your speed clarification. Um, I do think bookkeeping on these different speeds can get a little bit confusing. Uh, it's nice to have it spelled out here that the reductions or increases in speed apply across all types. Um, there will absolutely be builds based on exploiting this, but Hey, that's the fun of D&D. Um, wouldn't have it any other way. There are a bunch of other actions that are defined in here. The magic action, the search action, and the study action. Um, each of these, uh, well, so the, the magic action is for doing magical stuff, and it 
will explicitly say, say if it takes a magic action, but casting is not magic action. Um, the study and search action can invoke any given ability check uh, at the DM's discretion, which is interesting. The part that I like about this is that, because we've seen that there are class features that will interact with these like actions. Um, specifically, I think the wizard has one for the study action. So I, I, I like that players have the agency to be like, I take the study action, and then the DM can kind of decide like which ability check to use for that, but the player has made sure that their bonus to study actions is going to apply to whatever goes on. So I think there is a little bit of a like, helpful um, dividing up responsibilities and ownership between the players being like, I want to make sure that I'm doing this type of thing, and the DM being like, I, I'm going to steer you towards the appropriate ability check for what I had in mind. So that's cool. Um, I do think that it is probably a little redundant with skill checks, um, but they seem to be into making this more specific. So fair enough. And that's about it. Uh, I am hard at work getting the magic classes reviewed and that video will be coming out in a few days. Uh, let me know what you think about the new playtest marshals and miscellaneous and don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss any new videos from me. Thanks guys. Thank you.